Remember, you are stronger than you think. Don't believe me? We're about to prove it. Welcome back. This is Jen Lee, creator and host of I Need Blue podcast, true crime to true life. As a survivor of armed robbery and abduction, I understand the trauma and triggers survivors experience. Knowing this and through my powerful podcast, I offer survivors a safe place to share their lived experiences. Survivors need blue to feel they belong. They are loved, understood, and my favorite, empowered. Please note, I Need Blue does contain sensitive topics which could be triggering. Please seek help if needed, and remember, you always come first. I Need Blue episodes can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and many listening platforms, including my website, www.ineedblue.net. There, you will find all the episodes, valuable resources, safety tips, my newly released book and ebook, Why I Survived by Jennifer Lee. And if your passion is to learn to podcast, you will find a Learn to Podcast PDF available as well. I would like to thank Shar Good, the talented violinist who composed and performed this opening music. You can find information about Shar Good on my website. As always, thank you for listening. Let's begin today's episode. My guest today understands firsthand the grips of addiction as she proudly announces she has been in recovery for over 34 years. I met Laura in August where she was a keynote speaker at the Central Florida Fentanyl Summit. I remember listening as she shared her journey, and as I heard her life struggles, the addiction, her message left me inspired, full of hope, and knowing I needed to help her share her story. I am proud to introduce Laura McCarthy. She is a retired, licensed mental health counselor and master certified addictions professional with the state of Florida. She is a subject matter expert in the field of addictions and substance use disorders. Through her lived experience and professional background, she brings a well-rounded message of hope and healing. She is passionate about providing resources, and we will share them with you today. She is the event organizer for the second annual Brevard Recovery Fest coming September 9th. 2023. All details will be in the show notes. Laura is a mother, grandmother, and wife married over 33 years. She is passionate about saving lives and ending the stigma of addictions and mental health. She is a published author of Mess to Majestic, a true story of recovery from trauma, shame, and addictions with biblical and clinical insights. Laura, myself, and the listeners of I Need Blue are here to support you on your continued journey of recovery. I look forward to hearing your story again, and I know it will bring a new and or perhaps a renewed feeling of hope for others who are struggling with addiction. Thank you for being my guest today, and welcome to the I Need Blue podcast. Thank you so much, Jen, for inviting me today to be with you. It's a blessing. Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. I think you and I think your story are amazing. And I'm I'm really excited to be able to share this with everyone. And one of the things that is important in your story, and we just kind of had conversation about it, is God. And you're not alone. God has been a very intricate part of a lot of people's stories. And for other, I I do believe from reading some more information on you that you were an atheist and part of your journey was becoming a believer. And so I would love for you to share part of that aspect of your whole journey as well. But on that note, I have heard you tell your story. You tell it so well that I said, you know what, you just go and, and share it with the audience. It's, it's amazing. 
Well, thank you. So, you know, I come from a long line of family addiction. I'm fourth generation addicted in my family line. And my father was an alcoholic. My grandmother was an alcoholic. My great grandfather was an alcoholic. Um, and they all, you know, use different types of uh, chemicals uh, in their life. And um, so to me, growing up, it was just normal. Right. Um, I used my first chemical at the age of 11 and it was a nicotine cigarette. And I just thought I was cool. And I thought that it felt amazing and it just changed the way I felt. Growing up in an alcoholic home, there's a lot of trauma that happens in an alcoholic home. In fact, Tion Dayton wrote a fantastic book called The ACOA Trauma Syndrome. And what I remember when I look back on my childhood is I was scared all the time. I just felt terrified and alone, deeply, deeply alone. And God was never mentioned in our household. Um, God uh, was dead. Uh, that was kind of the perspective back then. You think of back in the 60s and 70s as God was removed from the classroom. So there really wasn't any discussion at home or at school about God. And so um, I grew up really feeling alone. Yeah. During the different ages when you said you were really afraid, Mm -hmm. What were you afraid of? Oh, my dad was Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Sometimes he'd come home and he'd be warm and cuddly and friendly. And other times he'd come home and he was mean and angry and violent. Um, so you just never knew. We call it walking on eggshells. You just never knew who was going to be home, what was going to happen. There's always that feeling the shoe is going to drop. Uh, you just never know when it was going to drop. And then just something bad was going to happen all the time. And, you know, it's a classic pattern where alcoholics will build up everything around them because they're incredibly smart and intelligent and brilliant and loyal when they're not drinking. And there'd be periods of sobriety that were always followed by worse relapse. And then it would get horrible, awful, terrible. We moved a lot. People say, so your family was military. It's like, no, my family was alcoholic. <laughs> you know, my dad would build up this great career and then his drinking would just have it all crumble down around him. Uh, I was going to say with having to move so much, that probably instilled some fear as well because you were never able to establish roots. Right. Yeah, it's an insecure attachment, literally. Absolutely. The reality is all the researchers have been researching the disease of addiction for centuries, not just decades, but literally centuries. And nobody still knows really why one person becomes addicted and the other one doesn't. I mean, we know that the brain is different. My brain has an abnormal chemical reaction that a normal person doesn't have. First time I smoked a cigarette, you know, I coughed, barked my brains out, could have thrown up on the spot. And immediately I asked for another one. It did something for me that it doesn't do for normal people. They have that kind of experience and they go, whoa, I'm not ever going to do that again. You know, well, that's not my experience. I do one and I go, I want to do that again and again and again and again. And almost immediately I'm being kicked out of school and suspended and getting in trouble with teachers and my parents, uh, my mom was single at the time. She had left my father and just didn't know what to do with me. And, and of course, it progressed to by the time I'm 12, we're drinking, I'm drinking alcohol. And by the time I'm 14, I'm smoking pot every single day and then using heavier drugs. And it's just the disease of alcoholism, like any disease, has identifiable symptoms. And the symptoms are our progression. It's not getting better. It's getting worse. You know, now I'm getting expelled from school. I'm getting picked up by the police. I'm having all sorts of personal difficulties with friends and uh, relatives and just, <laughs> it, just a mess. By the time I'm 18, my mom, you know, basically gives me an ultimatum to leave the home and never come back or go to college. And I was very smart. My father had the IQ of a genius. He was a very smart person. I put the pieces together. Let's see, this comes with a car and a housing option. I'll take that. So off to college, I went literally eight days after graduating from high school. I was in college and stayed there year round and immediately found my people. And living that double life, like presenting to the world, you know, on one hand, I'm a professional skier. I'm a ballet teacher. I am a cheerleader. I am, you know, a yearbook editor for one of the top yearbooks per capita in the United States. I'm an overachiever. But on the other hand, I'm out there just drinking myself and drugging myself blindly into oblivion. You know, I start getting DUIs. I start ending up in domestic violence situations. I mean, it's just very, very tragic. You know, we often say that we're not stupid people who need to get smart, but we are sick people and we get progressively sicker. 
I did graduate from college within three and a half years, which was a miracle. I look back on it because I don't think I drew a sober breath the entire time I was there. I was just completely out of control and uh, came home to my high school sweetheart who died of an inoperable brain tumor within six months. And um, if we could say my drinking and drugging progressed even worse at that time, it did. And, and I will tell you that I can remember hitting the floor of my home at the time and basically thinking to myself that if there was a God, I couldn't reconcile a loving God who would allow this to happen. And my disease spun off into an even deeper well of depravity and depression and despair. I ended up following some friends down to Colorado to pursue my professional skiing career. They had started the pro mogul tour in Colorado, and I was slated to be a a mogul skier and um, got down there and couldn't get out of the bars, really, and got into a very violent relationship. And it was an officer, a police officer that escorted me down to the medical center, uh, asking me if I might consider going to one of those 12 step meetings. And I remember thinking to myself, I didn't do this to me. Like, clearly, he's got a problem. So he needs to go to one of those meetings, but I'm good. And this is uh, the symptom of denial, which is so powerful. Within a month, I had him removed from the home because he acted poorly. And I thought problem solved. Uh, Within a few months, I got two DUIs back to back, just 10 days apart. And I, I seriously looked at my arresting officer on the second DUI and told him, don't you realize you're ruining my life? I just got one of these. Um, Again, just unbelievable denial and blame. The addict blames everybody for their disease, for their life, for their lack of success. We're trapped in a veil of resentment and blame and fear and pain. And the whole time, I would tell you I'm not afraid of anything and I don't need anybody. You know, I got this. Uh, And one more time, it was suggested maybe I consider doing one of those, quote, 12-step meetings. I was never going to be like my father. I swore I'd never be one of those people. Um, But what happened was I started hearing people talk about seeking a power greater than themselves and having an experience. And I can remember sitting in meetings thinking that was just stupid, you know, judging everything, which was part of my defense mechanism. And uh, really honestly believing that I could control it. And I remember them saying, you know, if you've lost the ability to control your drinking, you might need what we have. And I remember thinking, oh, I can control it. Control that. Now I'm 24 years old at that point. I had never tried control drinking. Why would anybody want to do that? But that year I set out to try to prove to those people that I could control it. And I tried through every form of deception and experimentation to try to prove myself exception to the rule and therefore non-alcoholic or drug addict. And all I ended up doing was convincing myself that I was one. When we talk about spiritual experiences being a personality change sufficient enough to bring about recovery, that there's a shift in your thinking or feeling. And it's something that you don't produce. Now, I didn't know what spiritual meant. I had to look that word up in the Webster Dictionary and it said spirit led. I was like, well, that's interesting. What's spirit? I went and looked that up. It said God. Spirit is God. So a spiritual experience is a God led experience. And I can only give God the credit for what happened to me because I literally told a friend the last night I used I was going to have one. I meant it with every fiber of my being. I was, I had this professional business engagement. She was going to pick me up at six o'clock the next morning. I was going to be there. And um, she looked at me and she said, Laura, you know what happens to you when you drink? I said, not this time. Seriously, I'm just going to have one and I'll be home. Well, I had one and it was eight o'clock and that craving took over. And we talk about having this allergic reaction, this abnormal chemical reaction that happens in my body is that once I do one, I crave another one. Well, that craving took over. I had another one. I had another one. You know, it's only 10. I could have another one. It's midnight. I'll have another one. 4.15 that morning, I passed out with a fifth of black velvet. And I wasn't at six o'clock where I was supposed to be. The shift in my thinking as I came to at 6.15 and knew I wasn't where I was supposed to be. And um, we talk about self-hatred and bewilderment and despair. I I just couldn't believe I had done this again. 
But there was something in me that shifted in my thinking. And I would have told you at 4.15 that morning, I don't need those people. I don't need a program. I don't need help. I don't need God. But, you know, but when I came to at 6.15, there had been a shift in my thinking. And I knew, oh my gosh, I need those people. I need help. I need a program and I need God. And I don't know who he is or where he is or what he is, but I need him. And actually that was my prayer. Do you know where that shift came from? It had, I had to give the credit to God. I really did. I didn't wake up and say, I think I need to change my mind. I mean, I woke up in this state, everything in me shifted. And so a lot of people think the next thing that happened is a spiritual experience, but really that was the spiritual experience that I went from, I don't need anybody or anything. I don't need help. And I've got this to, oh my gosh, I am a mess. I've got this. And I became convinced in that moment that I was an alcoholic and a drug addict and I needed help. So I got on my knees, which I'd heard these people talk about doing. I'd never done it before. That just, you know, in my mind prior to that moment, that was foolish, you know, but here I am in my moment of desperation. I get on my knees and I cry out to this God I don't believe in or know and say, God, I don't know who you are, where you are, what you are. But if you are, I cannot live like this another day. And I had a physical experience where this power like poured into me and this audible voice spoke to me and he said, Laura, you will never, ever have to feel this way again. You will never, ever have to live this way again. And I felt a physical lifting of the obsession, compulsion, and the desire to drink or use any mood-altering chemical. And that was May 3rd, 1985, a little bit over 37 years ago. And uh, it was miraculous. Now, you know, in the biblical world, they would call that a deliverance. Well, I didn't know that. I was being delivered, right? But the thing about addiction is, a lot of people think they just need to get sober, but true recovery is not just staying dry. But when you took the alcohol and the drugs away from me, I was full of bitterness and resentment and self-hatred and shame. And I hated the world and I hated my parents and I hated life. And I, I just was full of hate and fear. What sense under anger, we know that anger and as a clinician now, you know, anger is a secondary emotion. There was really an incredible amount of trauma and there was a well of pain. And so I often say that we can clear the deck of a ship. We can clear away the drugs and the alcohol off the deck of the ship. But if you have a powder keg of shame and resentment and bitterness and pain, trauma sitting underneath the deck, we need to heal that. And so healing is possible. That's one of my messages that recovery is possible, that recovery is so much more than just not drinking or drugging, that literally there's healing and healing is not forgetting it's actually remembering with less pain. So I can talk about things that happened with my dad, my mom, um, in sexual abuse. I can talk about these things today freely without a lot of feeling engaged. That's not because I'm dissociated from it. I'm not detached from it, but because I've literally gone in and dealt with that trauma and that pain. It's very, very powerful. We look at healing being relational, and I don't look at my relationship with God as religion. Um, I look at it as a relationship, that I have a relationship with a loving Heavenly Father who loved me so much that he sent his son to die for my sins so that I could be at one with him for eternity, that he has invited me to an abundant table that has been set for me to join him. And so I see that as completely relational, not as religious. And I work daily to maintain a personal relationship with God as I understand him today for me, uh, because I know who keeps me clean and sober. It's not me. I never got myself clean and sober. I still don't get myself, keep myself clean. <laughs> all these years later, I still give God all the credit. He got me clean and sober. He'll keep me clean and sober. Um, but there's things that I need to do on a daily basis to grow in my spiritual condition and continue to do that healing work. We talk about healing in layers. There are so many layers to healing. It's like an onion. We're peeling layers. There's no done button. 
A lot of people think, oh, look, they went to a program for 30 days, they're done. And I think, oh, no, no, no. And I used to be a rehab therapist. So I understand, you know, that concept, we'd release them and they think, oh, they're all healed. They're all better. They're all, you know, no, no, no. If all we did in 30 days is just touch the tip of the iceberg, they've got to remember, there's still an iceberg sitting underneath there in my first 30 days of recovery. If God showed me all the trauma that I had to heal, I would have killed myself. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. That wave of trauma would have overwhelmed me to the point of such despair. Um, But over all these years, the layers have gently come and continued to work through. I still believe in therapy. I still believe I have a good therapist. Every therapist has a good therapist, right? I'm not a victim to anybody today. Nobody makes me feel anything. So many times we say, you make me angry. No, my response in life truly is my responsibility. And this is maturity and empowerment for me to own. If somebody comes along and hurts me, it's because there's a hurt in me that hasn't been resolved. And I can work on that to be resolved. My sponsor used to say, he was such a good man. He'd say, as I am today, nobody can hurt me. And I'd say, well, it's not true. People hurt me all the time. They go only if you let them. Yeah. And how I respond to the world is very important to me because I really believe that my goal as a believer is to continue to reflect the love and the compassion and the forgiveness of God in all of my situations and all of my trials and all of my circumstances, regardless of what other people are doing. That's true freedom. Otherwise, before when I was in codependency, which by the way, you sober up an addict you clean up an addict, you have a flaming codependent sitting underneath that disease, which is the behavioral component of addictions. We have the chemical component. We have a behavioral component. Every addict that gets clean and sober is a codependent. And all that means is they're using things outside of themselves to feel good. When in reality, I have to learn how to clean up what's inside to know that I am good and that it is all good. And then I can bring that to society and know that no matter what's happening outside of me, I can stay in my hula hoop and I can be safe, protected and well and strong and happy in spite of anything that's happening in this world. Wouldn't it be lovely if our world could grab that concept? Laura, I think we're going to take a quick break. I want to thank the listeners. I appreciate your support. And I hope as you listen to this episode or any episode, you're able to find one person to share it with as a resource. I find many times we have friends who don't like listening to information. They prefer to read it. Exciting news. For you, I have started a book series tied into this podcast. It's called Why I Survived. How Sharing My Story Helped Me Heal from Dating Abuse, Armed Robbery, Abduction, and Other Forms of Trauma by Jennifer Lee. It is my story, and like this podcast, it is filled with valuable information and resources. Check it out today, ineedblue.net. From there, I will send you an autographed copy, or the book is available on Amazon. Thank you for all the ways you support me and the I Need Blue podcast. You've said so many amazing things. I've been kind of writing them down so I don't forget. Two things off the top of my head is you don't have religion. You have a relationship with God. I think so many times people are like religion. Pump the brakes. That's establishment. Don't want anything to deal with that. Whatever. I don't either. (laughs) But when you take that and you're like, listen, it's it's a relationship. It's no different than, you know, your, your friend. Like you have relationships with people. And then the other is people continue to drink is because they don't want to see all that trauma. It's so overwhelming. You are very honest. You were like, I would have killed myself if I would have known all the trauma that was under underneath. And that is where your message of hope and, and the courage of you can do this. Thank you. I do want to state trauma is not what made me addicted. We have a lot of addicts and alcoholics that have never had any trauma. 
So I have to be very careful because there's a lot of people that say, oh, it was the trauma that made you not know. Again, we really don't know why some people have that brain abnormality. We do know that there's a higher level of substance misuse with trauma, right? But it is still not the cause of addiction. Nobody really knows what causes my brain to be so different than a normal brain. We do know, though, that trauma is certainly a barrier to can be a barrier to recovery because like you said, people don't want to look, they don't want to, they don't want to feel, they don't want to acknowledge it. And especially in churches, you know, well, that's in the past. It doesn't have anything to do with today. My, one of my favorite authors right now is Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by Peter Scazzaro. And he says, you might think you're done with your past, but your past is not done with you. (laughs) And it's so true. You know, people don't realize that they're a lot of times operating out of something that happened 30 years ago, and it just keeps getting re-triggered. So as a cognitive therapist, you know, we're always looking for those lies. And what I love about um, my faith is that being a minister of reconciliation means I'm going to reconcile your mind to truth. And the truth is we are all God's children and God don't make no junk. So wherever you got that message, if I'm not good enough, you know, that's an internal injury and you've got to repair it. If you don't repair it, then you will continue to reflect it and displace it out here onto other people, into your work environment, into your life, into your marriage, into all these things. But if I can own that the disturbance is within me, then there's hope because then I can work on me and we can change that and believe the truth that I am enough. I have enough. I do enough. I serve serve a God who's more than enough. And I am forgiven and I am deeply loved. You want to stand on the truth. I don't don't even believe in self-esteem. I think that's, you know, kind of self trying to pump self up. What I believe in is God esteem. And if God esteems me and he's the greatest power in the universe, then who am I to judge me? We are his special possession. A lot of times we come out of family systems with trauma and we don't matter and I'm unimportant and I'm not good enough. And we have all these lies that have attached themselves to us. And my job, you know, as a therapist is to help us identify the lie because it lies within yourself. And how can we get rid of it? How can we face and be rid of that lie and invite truth that we are really marvelous just the way we are? Forgiveness. Um, I've heard you talk about God and forgiveness, but where are you with forgiveness? We know that's that's a very powerful experience. Forgiveness is a very powerful experience. I a couple of experiences that I would share with you. One was the forgiveness of my father. I swore I'd never forgive my father, and um, I remember being about thirty days sober and clean. And I was telling a friend how my dad never did anything for me. He never sent a gift. He never sent a card. He never did anything. And uh, in the middle of that thinking, I had a thought, and the thought said, "This, you're twenty five years old. When did you ever send a gift?" When did you ever send a card? When did you ever make a phone call? And I've come to know that voice today to be the voice of God. For me, my higher power, like literally just dropped that little bomb in there. And I was like, whoa, stop me. And I had to think never. I had never sent a card, never sent a gift, never made a phone call. And so I found my father after nine years of being estranged from my father. I found him in a treatment program. He was uh, in a in Kansas and I was in Breckenridge, Colorado at the time. And he asked me if I could come visit him. He said, my call had made all the difference in the world. Now, I, I don't have a driver's license at this point. I don't have any money. I'm, I'm, I've just started a new job. I'm making $3.35. It's 1985, okay? We, didn't, we weren't making a lot back then. And uh, I just told him, I, I have no idea, but we'll see. And I walked into a meeting that day, and there were people visiting from that part of Kansas in that meeting in Breckenridge, Colorado. And they were actually going to be traveling to that part of Kansas. And in fact, the guy said that he used to go in and do uh, service work in that treatment center. He knew exactly where my father was. And if I wanted to ride along with them, that they would take me to where he was. I was like, yeah, I was like, what? You know, so I went to my boss and I was going to ask, could I take some, I'm a new job, right? Like, what are the chances of that? Before I could get anything out of her mouth, she says, Laura, I need you to take the rest of the week off. I can't afford to pay you. 
And I was like, wow, I think I'm going to Kansas. So I get in a car with this complete stranger, right? I get to Kansas. I call this guy. He picks me up. Another complete stranger takes me over to this treatment center. And I show up in the one day that's the family day, the one day of 30. That's the family day for my father. And I'm the only family that shows up. They had a noon meeting there. And uh, the guy that dropped me off said, why don't you invite your father to a meeting? And I said, okay. So I invited him to the meeting. He accepted. And we're sitting across the table from him. And, you know, all I've got at this point going for me is I'm willing and I'm honest. That's it. I mean, I, I, I mean I'm mean, i still feeling very resentful towards my mom. <laughs> I remember six months earlier, I said, I'm never going to forgive you, you know. But here I am sitting in front of him. You know, he said, my name is Ron and I'm an alcoholic when they did introductions. And the minute he said it, everything in me switched. And I realized that my father was as powerless over alcohol and drugs as I had been. And that up to that point in his life, alcohol and drugs had controlled every decision that he had made. And that I understood him like I'd never understood him before. And I literally felt all the resentment just lift off of me. And I entered into forgiving my dad and understanding my dad. And I would love to tell you that we went on to have this happy, joyous relationship. It actually became very toxic, um, very dangerous. He became very, very dangerous in his addiction. I had to set a lot of boundaries. Freedom in healing was literally when he died, he hated me. Um, I represented the only person in the family that was setting boundaries and saying no, and that's not okay. And I had gone from actually being a drinking buddy to the person setting all these boundaries. So uh, addicts in their disease, they do not like boundaries at all. And, um, And I could tell you that the day he died, I had an immense sadness. It was 16 years later from that experience. He actually ended up drinking himself to death. And when he died and I got news of it, I felt an immense sadness and an immense acceptance at the same time that whether he liked me or not wasn't what made me okay, that I was okay in spite of his disease and in spite of his hatred and in spite of his pain, that I had done the work for myself to get healing of my father wound and I could stand there it released from that and free to just love him and have compassion and sadness for him. And that to me is just true forgiveness. Same thing with uh, sexual abuse. I swore I'd never, ever forgive my abuser. And through a series of circumstances, and I do write about this in my book, In Mess to Majestic, I share the experience of how God began to show me um, that when he said that he suffered as we have suffered, I, I told him in my moment of rage when I was dealing with my sexual abuse, right around 14 years of recovery, it all came up, all the memories and everything and just rage came up with it. And I remember going to the carpet with God and saying, you know, you didn't experience sexual abuse. And, you know, he was so clear to me. He said, Laura, it's not about sex. It's about betrayal. And my son did experience betrayal. And uh, my son has experienced everything that you have experienced. And, and right then and there, there was a flip again in my thinking that God went from being the enemy that allowed this and caused this to he was part of the solution of healing. And as I was walking out to my car one day, I again heard that voice just say to me, what, what do you want? I'd been locked in a state of anger for a few months dealing with this. And, and I just said, you don't want to be free to love and to be loved and to experience love. And he said, well, I'm waiting. And I said, well, what are you waiting for? And he said, your whole life, I have waited for you to turn to me so that I could love you. And again, I felt that resentment lift. I felt forgiveness and love flow in. I ended up giving testimony at my church that year. And more people came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ that day than had been seen in years in that church. And I I can remember when the pastor asked me, if your perpetrator was in this room right now, could you wash his feet? And I could say, honestly, yeah, I could. I could wash his feet. I feel nothing. And again, We can remember, but healing is not forgetting. It's remembering with less pain. I had no pain attached to the experience. God had so deeply healed my heart and that experience. And also good therapy, um, spiritual experiences, uh, 12-step model. um, All of it works together for bringing about healing. Um, We need our village of people really to help us on this journey. Now, when it comes to like the 12 steps, is that something you continue throughout your life? 
Oh, absolutely. They're, they are, you know, truly biblical principles. Uh, all 12 steps really came right out of the Oxford movement, which was a Christian Judeo movement, which offers spiritual principles, the admission of weakness. It's not that I am weak, but I have a weakness. It's called the disease and I'm powerless over that, which means I have less power than necessary. It doesn't mean I'm a weak person at all, but it means that there's something way more powerful against me. And I know in Corinthians, it talks about in my weakness is his strength. So as I admit my weaknesses, I open myself up to the greatest power in the world to help me overcome this weakness. And so I still have the disease today. If I I know today for a fact that if I were to take a drink, we say we have an allergic reaction, you know, I'm going to break out in jails, institutions, and hospitals. Um, If I do one, you know, I'm going to have this reaction. uh, And I've proven it to myself over and over and over again. I have good meaning people say, well, couldn't God heal you? Yes. But what's really amazing is that I have no desire to go anywhere near. It's just that desire has been lifted completely. When I look at the 12 steps, the spiritual discipline for me to admit my need every day, I need you I need my community. I need my higher power. I need God as I understand him. I need my friends. I need my sponsors. I need my therapist. You know, I have need. It's okay to need. It's a language of needs. As we age, we really got to get comfortable with that because we need more, right? The the sad thing about addiction is it blocks that. It says, I don't need anybody. That's pride, by the way. I don't need you. I don't need help. The whole time I'm dying inside, I really do. So I've embraced that. I need we, the first word in the first step, we admitted I'm honest. Honesty is so vitally important. It's amazing how many people are so afraid to be honest about what they need or how they feel. And feelings, the language of feelings is a whole different language. Um, Making a decision every day. I have one decision to make. Am I going to do it my way or am I willing to try something new and different? You know, is my way working right? The definition of insanity is I'm doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different consequences. And so four step is just really looking at myself on a daily basis and saying, wow, you know, I have shortcomings. I have, I have character defects. I am a very strong personality, very strong. And you saw some of that at the, (laughs) you saw that at the summit and it's appropriate there in certain places. It's very appropriate, but that same personality can mow right over people. Right. And so learning about myself and listening to other people actually take my inventory and help me see sides of myself. And, you know, I thank God for people who can come up and say, you know, Laura, sometimes you're just terrifying. (laughs) (laughs) I don't mean to be terrifying, really. I got a great heart. You know, we live in a society that's very unintentional. They walk through daily life and they're very unconscious. And most of them are stuck in a pattern of belief of believing that the world is their problem or this person or this driver or this husband or this, you know, this family member is the problem. When reality is that any problem I have today is really what is is my disturbance. I mean, as long as it stays outside of me, I can't fix that. That's going to stay broken. And so then I stay in a perpetual state of plain victim. But the truth is. If I'm going to own my life and I'm going to make progress, I've got to own that I can impact people positively and negatively. And I have to look at that, not own their stuff, not own their triggers, but own my part in this world. And so that's vitally important for me. And six and seven is really just about inviting God to help me with whatever that defect is. When we look at the 11 step, it says praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. There's the knowledge of his will for me. God, help me. Help me bring calm to this situation. And the promise of the 12th step is getting well. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we carry this message. What is this message? That we can change, that we can get well, that we can be different. Uh, You know, if we're willing to do some things. I think uh, I'm intentional about recovery today. I want a clean house. They say, trust God, clean house, work with others and uh, cleaning away all that trauma and all that pain and all those lies and all those resentments to be free to love and help others through the journey. That's just brings joy to my heart. I can now thank God for all those things that happened to me that at one time I used to curse God for and say, you know, how could this possibly be good? And yet I know that God has not wasted a bit of my pain. He uses it every single day to help someone else in their pain get to a higher level of healing with their own. 
And what would you say to someone who has a loved one that's struggling? They don't know what to do to help them. What would you suggest? (laughs) Go to a 12-step program right away. (laughs) Al-Anon family groups, Nar-Anon family groups. There's also Mom Anon in Brevard County, if they're in Brevard County. Um, these are very powerful support groups that give tools and direction on what you can do on a daily basis. But I love the three C's. You can't control it. You didn't cause it. And you can't cure it. Try to encourage family members to self-care, self-care, self-care. Protect your assets. Protect your mental health. Protect your sanity and your peace. Do what you need to do today. Get in your hula hoop. Take care of what's in your hula hoop. And just trust that your loved one, uh, you can continue to carry the message that there's healing, there's hope, there's treatment, there's recovery groups, there's all sorts of resources available to you. I just can't do it for you. And that's very important. Letting go does not mean I stop caring about you. It just means I can't do it for you. And so when we talk about enabling the family system, family system a lot of times enables, that's where we start to raise their bottom because we pay their fines, we bail them out of jail. No, if someone's in jail, let them pay the natural consequences, praying about how to come alongside them, but letting them lead the way in their own recovery. Um, Because if you're working harder than your addict, you're in trouble. If you're making the phone calls for treatment, if you're you're making the phone calls to get the help and you're doing all that footwork and they're not doing any of that, that just tells you what their willingness level is. And then prayer. Pray like crazy that they become willing. It's the holidays. And for some that are maybe in the beginning stages of their recovery, could be triggering for them, could be hard. What advice do you give them? Community, community, community. So important, whether it's in church, whether it's in a 12-step room, um, there's a lot of what they call alcathons this time of year where clubs and different meetings um, offer, you know, food and round-the-clock meetings and just fellowship and break the isolation. That is so key. Your disease will tell you don't go out, don't connect, don't tell anybody, don't, don't, don't. But recovery says do, do, do. Do reach out. Do ask for help. Do come. Come and show up. I loved how they presented the second step to me because I didn't believe, right? And they said just come and you will come too. And you will come to believe it's a promise. And it's exactly what happened to me. I think that 95% of early recovery is about showing up in spite of what your head tells you because your head will tell you, don't do it. Don't go. I don't want to. I'm not going to feel comfortable because there's nothing in early recovery that's comfortable. In fact, it's very uncomfortable because what's comfortable is being impaired and being numb and being checked out. Okay. So Coming and being uncomfortable and walking through being uncomfortable and being embraced and receiving is part of the healing journey and seeing that I can walk through being uncomfortable and I can stay clean and sober and then find out it really wasn't that bad after all. In fact, this might have been the best thing that ever happened to me, which is so amazing. Oh, absolutely. I appreciate you again sharing your story and all that you do to bring awareness, your passion and your purpose. I truly appreciate you. You're very welcome. I don't know if I told you, but we also started a new church. It's called Recovery Church. It meets on Monday nights from 630 to 8 o'clock. And uh, it meets at Life Point Church at 1420 Sportsman Lane. And it's for anyone in recovery from anything. All 12-step programs are welcome. And if uh, you want to learn more about Jesus, come, come, you're invited to the table. That's every Monday night, 630 to 8 o'clock. So during the holidays, that's just another resource. Um, Quest 180 would be another resource up in Vieira. So you can Google Quest 180. That's another great resource. And of course, you've got all your 12-step programs, AA, NA, um, Al-Anon, Nar-Anon. If you need help, please just reach out. 211 Brevard huge resource. You can even text 898-211, type the word opioid to 898-211. And again, more resources will come up available to you. The other thing um, to go look at is brevardpreventioncoalition.org. 
and they have a resource page. And that's where you'll actually find the yellow card, the digital copy of the yellow card. Um, I have all the resources available on my website from episodes, things that we have talked about, like Space Coast Recovery is on there. Thank you for all of that information. Do you have a prayer? Would you like to end this? Yeah, let's pray. I haven't done that on an episode before. Sure. Well, Father, we just acknowledge your presence today in this place. We thank you that truth has been spoken, that there is hope, there is healing, and that you love us. You didn't make any junk, that we're all your children, and you love us fiercely, that you choose us, that you prepared us to have a deeper relationship with your love. And so, Father, I pray for those who are suffering right now, especially during the holidays. They might be questioning whether you're real or whether you're even there. Lord, I pray that you would just reveal yourself. Your word says that you reward those who seek you. And so right now I pray that like the promise in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous said, God could and would if he were sought, that they would seek. They would seek help. They would seek treatment. They would seek you and that you would reward that seeking with life and recovery and freedom from addiction and from the bondage of self. We just praise you for all the work that you do here. And I thank you for Jen and all that she's doing and all the people she's ministering to. We just pray a special blessing on her and this program. May it be heard by those today that need to hear this life-saving message that recovery and healing is possible. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I can never get enough of that. You know, we never can have enough blessings. I'll take all I can get. Amen. Me too. Thank you so much for listening today. This is Jen Lee with the I Need Blue podcast. And remember, you are stronger than you think. 